people? Okay, now you can hear me, great. So welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch. I hope you met old colleagues, made new friends, did lots of networking. That's one of the most valuable experiences about coming to conferences like this, particularly when you're a translator and often working in solitude and uh, alone. So it's good to know that there are other people out there. Um, thank you for uh, tweeting so furiously. We have been trending just before lunchtime number one in Belgium. And, wait for it, seventh in the whole of the European Union. <laughs> However, with success comes a downside. Because the machines saw how successful we've been. And I don't know if anyone's noticed, but there are some strange things in the Twitter feed that probably weren't put there by you, and in fact, we know they weren't. Uh, so if you see strange content in there, it's just proof that we're doing the things that we should be doing and we're attracting attention. So thank you, thank you. And don't be alarmed. <laughs> So now, over the next hour, we're going to be considering about empowering people and how public institutions, civil society, benefit from translation. We have four experts giving short e presentations, followed by a chance for you to ask your questions, and you can send them on Slido as well, of course. So I would now uh, like to ask the panelists to come and join me on stage. And while they're making themselves comfortable, please remember that to check that your mobile phones are on silent. Um, and if you want to keep tweeting, please do. It's uh, 2019 TEF. Great. So we're all settled. Um, and I'd like to introduce this topic. So translation does not just bring economic or monetary benefits. It can also empower people by giving them access to information they need. In fact, as we know, not everything is about money, even though it would be nice. <laughs> um, translation is, always, is also a way to convey values, as we heard from the Commissioner this morning. It's a way of showing hospitality to foreigners as an instrument of equality, fairness and dignity when it helps migrants integrate into their new country, or when NGOs such as Amnesty International fight oppression. Here, the benefits of translation are invaluable. In other words, translation does not just bring added value, it also helps defend common values. For the public sector, translation is a public good to, be ensure, to ensure equal access to information, empowerment and engagement, an intrinsic part of democracy. To discuss these topics, I'm joined by my four experts from different areas of the um, public institutions and organisations. Next to me, I have Pascal Riloff, who is head of the PSIT Training and Accreditation Service at the Flemish Government Agency for Int Integration. And he's also president of the European Network of Public Service Interpreting and Translation, EMPSIT. EMPSIT? Yes. Uh, we have Lucio Banullo, who is head of translation at human rights NGO Amnesty International. We have Luca Curioni, lots of Luca and Lucio's uh, on the panel today, um, who is a director at, of digital lead project at the Municip Municipality Council, much easier, Council of Milan. And on the end over there, we have Luca Mangiat, who is a coordinator of the Your Europe Information Web Portal, run under the auspices of the European Commission's Directorate General for internal market, industry, entrepreneurship, and SMEs, uh, known for short, thank goodness, as DG Grow. Uh, please give them a big warm welcome. So we're going to start by hearing from Pascal Riloff. He's wearing two metaphorical hats today, um, one as the president of EMPSIT, while the other is uh, his work uh, in the public service interpreting and translation at the Flemish government's integration agency, which he will use uh, to give examples of uh, the work that he does. 
After exploring the definition of public service translation, he's going to examine its relevance for society and outline examples where public service translation has had a positive impact on people's lives. Pascal Riloff, please take the floor. It's now yours. Good afternoon, everyone. A time to digest the wonderful lunches that you had. And hopefully, there's some space for focus as well. Public service translation for access to services. Oh, no, it's the other one. <laughs> OK. Give me a brief moment first to explain EMSIT. EMSIT, the European Network for Public Service Interpreting and Translation of or Community Interpretation and Translation, if you will, takes initiatives on quality care. Um, for example, we have devised uh, a public service interpreting competency profile on knowledge, necessary skills, attitudes, and we organize networking activities, exchange with, with and among practitioners, researchers, uh, trainers, public services, and policy makers, for example, through our in-dialogue conferences conference, which is on the 21st and 22nd of November in Antwerp. It is a traveling event. It will be going to another European city every three years. And the theme is interpreter practice, research and training, this time the impact of context. And there we have a pre-conference activity on the 20th, which is together with SKIC, or on with their, we, we're going to have a knowledge center for interpreting or inter interpretation, editathon. I didn't know what an editathon was, do you know? It's a marathon while editing and adding texts to, 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 the, uh, to that platform, to that knowledge center. EMSID is interested in feeding EU and national policy on language or communication services, interpreting and translation for public services, communicating with new immigrants, foreign language clients. Public services, well, they are social services like social welfare, housing, social housing, integration, social integration, employment, but also in the educational realm, health, asylum, legal and legal service settings. If we look at Europe, the EU and broader, the PSI, PST, public service interpreting and public service translation landscape is rel relatively, relatively or pretty scattered uh, in terms of policy and funding, in terms of quality care, and in terms of uh, public service interpreting and translation services, the provision of the services. Some member states have organized themselves, others have not yet, and a lot is based on ad hoc and voluntary work. Um, so it's pretty much scattered. So it's also difficult to give an overall picture of what is going on in Europe or in the EU. So allow me to go from the bigger hole, the larger hole, to something a lot smaller, uh, the northern plot of land in this country, Belgium, Flanders, which is also a, a political entity uh, in, within the Belgian state. So as a pass pro, to, pro toto, we go to Flanders, Belgium, um, and there we have legislation. We have a decree, an integration decree, with two articles on public service interpreting and translation. It was drawn up in 2013, and it's been eff effective since then. In Article 41, it is described what public service translation is. So the decree has the effect, it has the impact of law. Uh, in the region of Flanders. 
Public service translation or community translation is an instrument that supports written communication between service providers and a foreign language clients by means of transferring messages in their entirety, entirely, and faithfully from a source to a ta target language. It goes in parallel with public service interpreting. In fact, there's a lot more public service interpreting going on between public services and clients than translation. And the logic behind that is that most uh, um, service encounters are encounters, that are oral com commun commun communicative encounters between uh, a, uh, a public uh, service provider, healthcare worker, social worker, uh, etc., teacher, uh, and uh, his or her clients. So usually you have, whenever a, an interpreter is there, you have three people in the room, the public service provider, the client, and the interpreter. It's so only at a second level that uh, translation comes in. Some more information on the, the decree. Article 41, public service interpreting and public service translation are carried out by interpreters and translators who are included in the Flemish register for public service interpreters and translators. The register is a central database for certified interpreters and translators and is monitored by the Flemish government integration agency for which I work. Article 42, by developing, applying, and evaluating quality tools, the Flemish Government Integration Agency con contributes to the continuous quality assurance and quality improvement of PSIT. I forgot the T there. But what is its relevance? What is public service translation and interpreting's societal re relevance? Why should we do it? Why is it there? Since, well, you will all be aware of the fact that since 89, 90, the nature of migration has fundamentally changed. The Iron Curtain fell. Internet and online communication started to appear and bloom. Uh, engendering intra-European mobility and migration increase further pushed and pulled by climate change, climate problems, turmoil, war and disaster, poverty, and a quest for a better life. No longer do we only see the traditional groups of immigrants from that moment onwards, but people come from about everywhere. To show that diversity that we have come to call super diversity, in this fundamentally changed and changing world. Uh, I can state that in Flanders, in that register I was referring to, Register of Certified Interpreters and Translators, we have about 600 uh, certified public service interpreters and or translators. To be exact, 588. For 40 languages. But we need more. Demand is much, much, much higher and is far more uh, diversified than 40 languages. Almost every month, a new language pops up for which we try to find candidates, which is exceedingly difficult. About, I estimate that about 80% of our certified uh, translators and interpreters are from our former immigrants who follow training who did the certification test and so forth. And about 20% are uh, polyglots who went through the program. And last but certainly not least, uh, students or uh, uh, masters from uh, our universities. To give some examples of those 40 languages, which I won't because I only have four minutes left. Um, <coughs> Perhaps I'll give some examples of how public 
some real life cases of how translation in our realm uh, changes lives. I remember this Ukrainian man um, who spoke little uh, and broken Dutch in an employment agency. An interpreter was called for, was called in, and we learned that he happened to be a truck driver in the Ukraine. He had a Ukrainian driver's license that was finally translated into Dutch. He followed an extra course for truck, as a truck driver, uh, some si about safety procedures as well in Dutch, and I'm passing a button. Okay. Ah. Uh, networking lunch, great. <laughs> Very back in time. Mm -hmm. That means I have more time because. You know, <laughs> Nice try. One more example, no, two examples. Hospitals informed consent forms, uh, for example, need to be translated. Uh, translation of flyers in health prevention campaigns, for, for example, for uh, prevention of uterine cancer. Translation of diplomas in diploma equivalence procedures, and so on. So things that really change people's lives and help them find a place here, uh, and help them thus help them integrate. In order f to, this is not me. <laughs> it's the machines again. Ah. Mm. So the service I, uh, I'm head of in Flanders is the Public Service Interpreting and Translation Training and Accreditation Service. Maintaining the centralized register. We've drawn up a competency profile years ago. We provide some training. Uh, we have devised a code of ethics for translation and interpreting. There are our certification tests, and we collaborate with universities, for example, the University of Antwerp and uh, the, the, the KU Leuven campus uh, Brussels. We have an integrated certification test, which is at the same time a certification test. And you're certified, you can go and translate and or interpret, depending on the test, in that, in, in that context in Flanders. And at the same time, it is an exam. Uh, it is the, ex the interpreting exam for uh, students from those universities. Last slide, I think. Oh, the other way around again. Um, public service translation and interpreting, as I say, in Europe, leaves a scattered image in terms of quality care, in terms of policy. And policy and structural funding are badly needed. Otherwise, all these things cannot be done. So we look towards Europe to help us out here, to play a coordinating role, because the legislation itself will probably remain member state legislation, member state policy, but a lot of coordination is needed, and I think Europe can come in, come in there. Europe is already, through DGT now, giving us a platform here, which we appreciate. Uh, but perhaps, uh, as MPSIT, we need to take a further step now and see how we can convince, with facts and real-life cases, the European Commission to help coordinate uh, uh, the landscape. Our policy recommendation, which we have already sent to the European Commission, I think, in 2013 or 14, are the following. Acknowledge public service interpreting and translation as necessary instruments within a European integration policy that incorporates diversity and equal opportunities. Two, guarantee one's right to high quality language support in service provision. Three, introduce European PSI and PST quality standards. Four, acknowledge and finance PSI and PST services and provide support for consultation and partnership structures such as MSID. One should never forget oneself. I thank you very much. Thank you.
And we're going to stay in the area of integration and rights and translation uh, with our next speaker, who is Lucio Manuglio, who is in charge of translation at Amnesty International. He has an academic background in translation and has worked as a freelance translator, terminologist and interpreter. This afternoon, he's going to tell us how Amnesty's language strategy has evolved since it was set up in 2007, highlighting the challenges its translators face whether it be the common or golden ones that we all know of time pressure, to new formats or having to take and translate documents that are still being finalised. A complete nightmare. Oh, don't even want to think about it. Anyway, please tell us more. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Lucio Banugno. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's see if it, this works fine. Yes. So, language has always been at the core of Amnesty's work. Since its beginning, the organization acknowledged and recognized the importance of language as a tool to broaden its reach, its visibility, but most importantly, its human rights impact worldwide. And such a deep understanding actually led to the creation of the language policy and strategy of Amnesty International in 2007. And in particular, the language strategy uh, is a response to the movement needs uh, for adequate tool for internal democracy, but also to the external impact on human rights of Amnesty International. Um, if you know, we think of one of the most visible outcome of the language policy and strategy of Amnesty International, I have no doubt it's the Language Resource Center, the LRC. Uh, which was created in 2011 and which is a virtual network of language experts operating from different locations worldwide and providing expert language services to the movement. So, for example, I'm talking about translation, interpretation, multilingual desktop publishing, multilingual video production, and so on and so forth. You name it. Um, but it's here in the, translation, in the, in the um, LRC that the translation service sits. And I hope you can see it from the map. I try to put you know, red you know, spots <laughs> uh, so you can identify from where the uh, translation activity is managed. So you can see that actually um, we are a bit spread around the globe. Uh, we have four in-house uh, translation teams, one in Madrid where I sit, as well, uh, one in Paris, looking into French uh, translation, one uh, the Arabic team between London and Beirut, then the Chinese team in Hong Kong, and um, then the, we have uh, regional language coordinators, uh, one of whom is you know it's uh, in, uh, they are in in different regions of course, and looking after the language needs of the region. Uh, we have one in Beirut uh, looking after MENA. Uh, one in uh, Nairobi looking after the Africa region, of course, one in France looking after the ECA region, and one in Hong Kong looking after the Asia-Pacific, but also part of the Americas region. But let's have a look maybe at the translation activity of 2018 to give you an idea of what we do or what we did. So we translated almost one, uh, not, no, not one, <laughs> nine million uh, words in 2018, which is not bad if you think that we are an international NGO. Uh, and this equals more or less to 20,000 pages of documents that we have handled, or my team has handled, um, for 80 plus text types. So we translate all sorts of material that you know, in-house uh, teams, our colleagues produce, from research report to campaigning material to uh, media material, uh, websites, MOOCs, uh, everything you can, you, know, you can think of really, and uh, that you see, for example, uh, you know, the Amnesty produces in different languages. It's us who produce them. Uh, and we did this in 48 languages in 2018. The most strategic language of, uh, languages of Amnesty International are English, mostly being always the source language, uh, although the landscape is a bit changing uh, lately since the opening of uh, regional offices. Then French, Arabic, and Spanish. But we also did translate into 44 other languages, uh, in particular uh, regional local languages like uh, Igbo, Hausa, uh, Khmer, 
Azerbaijani, Kyrgyz, uh, and many, many others. Um, but, you know, when you look at this uh, activity, you might be thinking, okay, what challenges do you guys face? We do face many, uh, but there are some recurrent ones that we have for sure. Um, and the first of which is, you know, a shrinking, I mean, I think you're very familiar with this, a shrinking of time, you know, allocated to translation. A second recurrent challenge is uh, actually a fascinating one because, you know, it's an increasing and fast evolving variety of text, text supports. Uh, we are miles away from, you know, the old uh, printed uh, word material or reports. Uh, nowadays, our colleagues want to engage, you know, their audience want to engage you too uh, with different, you know, web platforms, apps, social media strategies, and etc. So we are faced with a continuous studying uh, and a quick one. So we are asked, for example, uh, we, are, we are told that you know our colleagues want to translate a particular platform, a particular app, etc. And we are um, basically expected not only to provide the translation, but also to provide them with uh, uh, you know, the knowledge or to let them know, uh, to make them aware basically of how translation could work or not in that platform. And I think this is, you know, we were talking about added value of the translation, and this is an added value that my team you know, uh, contributes to. Um, so it's a challenge, but as I was saying, a fascinating one. Then we have the scary one, uh, which is the no final versions of documents being sent for translation. So consequently, we do receive updates or corrections while the translation is ongoing. If you think of you know, a 25,000 report and you, you know, a string, you know, very little time, a timeline to produce it, but then you know, updates are coming through at some point, well, what do we do? We scream. Uh, no, we don't scream. <laughs> well, sometimes we do scream as well. Um, but no, we try to actually, uh, you know, no, we try. We do request actually tra a tracked file, you know, with, to easily identify uh, those changes. We then reprocess the, the, the file, the, the document, with our cut tools for those language combinations where cut tools are used. For all the others, which are the vast majority of the other languages, we do rely on the uh, tracked files. Um, when these um, corrections are extensive, because you can imagine, I mean, these are not just errors, typos, etc. But for example, there could be an evolving human rights situation in a country which is analyzed in the report. So they are very key corrections. Um, so we do ask for an extension, or sometimes we negotiate on launching selected parts of the report for, and then circulate the full translation afterwards. Uh, after the launch, um, but I have to say that most of the time, the brilliant team I have succeeded in delivering without you know, even thinking of those challenges, but they do just deliver. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, and, and then the last one, I think you're familiar too, sorry, you're familiar with this too, lack of key information, like gender, references, of course, a lawyer in English, yeah, it's a lawyer, but it's not a lawyer. I mean, you have to know if it's a woman, a man in Spanish, in French, and many other languages. So sometimes authors don't really think of this because for them it's so natural to just draft, you know, the source. But uh, it's no natural to, you know, to think of okay, how this would play in another language. What do they need? But when we talk about challenges, what um, I like to think is that. Um, the approach we take within Amnesty in the, in the LRC, in the translation team, is that we try to engage as much as possible with our colleagues. And how do we do that? We do that by sitting in planning meetings. So try to be there from the very beginning. Uh, try to catch those needs uh, or those possible challenges and try to explain to our colleagues the needs we have and especially why we have them. I mean, the answer to us here is simple. We just want to deliver a high quality translation who would contribute to the human rights impact worldwide. But sometimes it's not so easy to, you know, let our colleagues 
who are just thinking of their deadlines, uh, uh, you know, understand this. But you know, we are we are close to that anyway, and we work on that every every day. So. Um, then, I mean, but translation is not only about figures, it's not only about, you know, challenges. To me, I like to think that translation, in particular in Amnesty International, is about impact and its contribution of the impact. So, um, for example, uh, as I said earlier, um, basically, uh, the, the, I mean, the language strategy is a response to the movement to, uh, for an adequate tool uh, for internal democracy, and in particular, I have to say that we, for example, we translate, I mean, all the uh, internal uh, governance uh, papers are available in three languages, English being the source, but then we have Spanish and French, uh, which are translations. Uh, so can you imagine a big movement like Amnesty's ones tackling key human rights issues only in English and in remote you know, countries of the world? To me, it's impossible. I don't know about you. Uh, and then we have other, of course, other um, external facing. I mean, you know, the, 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 the contribution to the impact that comes through the translation of our external facing communication. So our website, which is mostly translated, so the English being the source, but French, Arabic, and, um, and French, uh, sorry, and Spanish, uh, Spanish <laughs> uh, being translations, and we do take care of take care also of the uploading, uh, then urge actions, uh, reports, etc. But the last one in particular is the, the contribution to the human rights impact which comes through translation via the media. And this is a recent case, for example, our Chinese translation being used fully by the Hong Kong um, local uh, media outlet for the coverage of the Hong Kong reckless policing. So to me, this is impact. Uh, so to summarize, translation is a powerful enhancer at Amnesty International. It enhances our internal democracy and governance system. It enhances our external communication. And this needs to remind us about uh, a fundamental, actually a critical uh, element or feature of Amnesty International. It's multilingual identity. So translation also contributes to enhance the corporate brand image of Amnesty International. And last but not least, it contributes to enhancing or to, you know, to the growth of Amnesty International and most importantly, to the human rights impact of Amnesty International. So thank you very much and thank you to the interpreters as well. Thank you. Uh, and if the audience has any questions, there will be a little time at the end. Um, so um, do send in questions on Slido, and also we'll be asking a couple of questions from the floor as well. Uh, now it's time for our third speaker, Luca Corioni, who is the director of the Digital Lead Project and chief digital officer at Milan City Council. Luca has been instrumental in redesigning Milan's digital channels, which are key as they're the main ways that citizens contact the council and the council communicates with citizens. Translation is vital in this context because about 35% of Milan's residents are non-Italians. So there's a great need for information about the council's 400 plus services to be available in multiple languages. And then, of course, there are all the tourists, the professionals, the students, uh, the investors, who are looking, have a different type of interest in the city, and their needs are catered for in a different website, Yes Milano, which we'll be hearing about a little bit more in the tourism um, session tomorrow, just a quick plug on that. But to tell us um, how his team provides the translations for all these outlets, please welcome Luca Corioni. Hello to everybody, and I'm really excited to be in such a community, and I will try to bring the perspective of uh, an IT guy, basically, so yes, I am, uh, working in the IT department and dealing with uh, a very important project for the city of Milan, that is the, developing, uh, the development of the new uh, website, the complete reengineering uh, of that. Why is so important? Because we are talking about uh, um, a website that deals with uh, one million of uh, um, unique uh, visitors per month. So that's uh, 
uh, it's our key um, channel where we talk with our people. Uh, first of all, to whom we are talking with. So we are talking with a citizen with 1.4 million uh, inhabitants, 35% of them are not Italian. Uh, we have city user, um, meaning by that people that are coming to Milan, that they use the services, uh, use our services, and leave the city not being a resident. And then we have uh, talents that want to transfer in Milan for studying or, uh, or for work. Uh, investors that want to open up an activity uh, in Milan or invest in the city, and visitor, tourists, okay? All of them wants clarity, wants uh, being capable to be listened uh, by the public administration, and uh, they want simplicity. So they want very simple information uh, provided. What they are looking for, and uh, behind that, believe me, there are a lot of analytics with it at the beginning of assessing uh, the project. First of all, uh, most of them that, that come to our domains, more than 90%, are searching for services. Okay. Meaning by services, they are the 450 and, and even more uh, services that we have uh, uh, list, uh, we are offering to the city. 35% of that uh, um, directly provided online. Um, then next to the services, uh, um, there are people that want to participate in the uh, um, Milan activities. So they want to provide their feedbacks about how administration is doing things. They want to provide ideas, so they want to participate. And finally, there are uh, tourists especially that are looking for information of uh, uh, the attractiveness of the city. So uh, we... Uh, develop the project as the opportunity to develop a dialogue strategy in line with the needs of our user. First of all, with the, the website, uh, a new website focused on services. And this is, and I'll provide the, uh, all the details in next uh, slide. Uh, then we have a platform uh, where um, we deal with the uh, district development plan to involve citizens at the district level. And uh, a website that is more the focus of a tomorrow morning section, um, that it's focus on storytelling. So if the first one, um, it's more about communicate services in a very lean or I would say almost bare-bone, and then you will help me with the right translation, <laughs> um, in a, the bare-bone uh, communication of services. Uh, the second one is about storytelling, because we are, want to attract, we want to sell uh, Milan as a city um, to, to our uh, target. So we did uh, comune.milano.it, First of all, we focus on uh, being mobile first. Uh, the city, uh, it's better uh, and works better on the mobile because that is the universal means of access to, uh, for all our uh, citizens. Um, one click for accessing the services, or at least uh, that's the, 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 the aim we are putting. As I said, focus on services. So we are not putting the storytelling about um, uh, our measure that is telling the, uh, how wants to develop uh, the city in a political way. So it's directly looking to what are the services that are most uh, searched uh, and visited by uh, other uh, by, by by our user. So. Um, if you want Amazon-like, we are putting uh, the most visited uh, services on front, then the last one you saw. So if you access a specific content, a content, then you go back and you find it there. And then we have some editorial push uh, on the bottom. And last part, we develop a self-service area where we are not going to provide pool information, but if you log, uh, and, 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 you, uh, um, and um, you have been recognized by the system by putting your uh, identity. You access to your, what we call fascicolo del cittadino. 
uh, you, you can help me by a better translation than citizen folder. What is that? Uh, is the, um, the area where I find my transaction, where I find my service. I don't have to say what I have to pay. I find uh, the, uh, the tax, uh, the right amount there, one click, and I pay the taxes. So that's uh, the concept behind. So coming to uh, language and coming to trying to offer uh, these services also to um, a, a group of uh, inhabitants, 30% of them, that are not so uh, proficient in Italian. So um, that community is mainly, uh, first of all, Philippines. We have um, people from Egypt, so uh, Arabic as the native language, and uh, Latin America, Spanish. So this is the, the target we, we need to also uh, service in a digital way. We didn't go for a translation and the use of a translator. We use uh, an automatic uh, translation. Uh, I'm aware of also New York is doing the same things. Um, why we did it? Because we cannot, uh, off, um, we cannot manage to uh, provide for the service that are, that, have been up, that are updating each day, basically. Uh, imagine there you need to um, provide uh, um, a new uh, communication due to a strike uh, that the office are closed. Um, and uh, you are dealing with um, one specific os office uh, for each of the 430 services I was referring to. Um, basically, was not manageable. Neither, in especially in terms of internal resources, able to manage that complexity of translating it in all the language, and on the other part, also buying uh, it on the market. Yes, we can do it, but then it becomes a one-off project that becomes old uh, after uh, basically one week. So we tried, this is an experiment, we, we activated these uh, services with uh, Google Translate, and uh, it's as simple as uh, putting a, a, a simple script, um, but has a lot of uh, uh, issues. First of all, uh, wrong translation, especially where there's no comment, uh, context. Imagine what you can translate for Comune di Milano. You translate common, so um, absolutely wrong instead of municipality. Uh, or um, it's, it, there are some words that are impossible to translate and provide very uh, funny stuff, like uh, albo pretorio, that is a, a word that uh, I don't know even to, uh, how to explain you what it is. Um, uh, then also Google is retiring that services in favor of the API services. So we are exploring basically two alternatives. One is staying in this uh, post-publishing uh, uh, translation way. Uh, st uh, always we, are talk we are always talking about uh, automatic translation. So activating services that are, uh, then are able to provide a whitelist of uh, the keywords that you want to provide the specific translation. And there are uh, some examples, I write uh, one of them there. Or uh, do something more uh, mm, sophisticated, uh, that is a pre-publishing uh, use of the automatic translation. Basically, when we, you produce a content in uh, Italian, you automatically obtain from one of the API services I've listed there, including uh, the possibility of using, and we are exploring that, the e-translation API of the European community. Mm, there are some languages missing, but most of them are there. Uh, then you have the uh, personalization of the translation as an opportunity. Of course, you need to have people with the skill for doing that, and that is uh, the if you want opportunity or issue of that option, and then uh, you are publishing a multi-language uh, website. So I uh, think my time is up, so thanks of all, thanks to everybody. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And while you may not have seen the Milan City Council's website, I bet some of you have seen the information web portal that we're just about to hear a little bit more about now, Your Europe. Hands up, anyone who's used Your Europe? Okay, those of you who haven't, it's a fantastic resource. You have to go and see what's there. Anything from, the, if you want to start a business, things like late payments, that's quite interesting. Uh, there's even a calculator as to how much you can charge your clients. Uh, VAT rules, GDPR. But also, if you want to just find out if you can move to another country, access to education, healthcare. And it's very, very different to all the other European Commission websites. I think we can say that, Luca. Um, and basically, it's um, you, you're, um, um, I mean, you have a background in communications and training as a linguist that helps drive the underlying principles behind the service. It's got to be highly understandable, super user friendly, and easy to find through strong search engine optimization. So, Luca Mangiat, let's hear a little bit more about your Europe. Well, you. I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm not surprised I didn't see so many hands, uh, right? Actually, we never really promoted the brand very much. Most of our visits come from Google, from Google Search, and I'll say something about that. Uh, Your Europe is a website managed by the European Commission uh, where we try to explain what rights and obligations citizens and entrepreneurs have when they want to go and study, work, travel or start a business or do business with other EU, EU countries. So in a way, it is where the Commission explains what happens at the end of our legislative work. So when rules have been decided, have entered into force and become concrete rights or obligations for citizens and businesses. So um, we have to do it in an, under an understandable language, which means two different things to me. First of all, the language that we use on the website must be clear and accessible to everybody. We have a small team of editors that are actually, in a way, also translators. They work with legal officers, with experts, and they translate legal text into something that people can understand. So they do it in English first, but then, and that's the second aspect, we translate also in all official EU languages. The website is available in all official EU languages, with the exception of Irish Gaelic. So that's the only one we do not cover, but we do have all the others. Um, as you can see, it has a um, citizens section and a business section. And uh, what is really important for us is that we put the user at the center, so the, the, the single citizen, the single business owner, uh, and that we structure our content around their needs. So we work with lots of different commission departments, I think more than 15 at this, at this moment, and we try to structure their work into something that is meaningful for the final user. We have a section on travel, which is the most successful of the website. There's content in there on passenger rights. So the experts are in a DG, which is called DG Move. There's also content about customs and uh, how, much, uh, how many bottles of wine you can bring back from France after holidays uh, without having to justify uh, why you have so many in your car. That the experts for that are in DigiTaxud. Uh, doesn't matter for the user to know, they don't need to know uh, where the experts sit. We have it in a coordinated way. We present it from the perspective of a user that doesn't know anything about the commission, basically. So that, that is crucial to us. Um, we present clear information on EU rights, but in many cases, EU rights are relatively thin. For instance, on registering your residence abroad, there are some very basic rules. Nobody can ask you to justify why, as an EU citizen, you come to Belgium uh, during the first three months you are here. But after three months, it really depends on the country. In Belgium, you have to go to the municipality and sort of justify, I hope there are no lawyers here, uh, <laughs> and justify why you are there, show you have a, a, an employment contract, show you have a, a proof you are registered at university or that you have own resources. 
In other countries, you don't have to do it. After three months, you can stay on without registering. Uh, what is interesting for the individual is to know exactly, I want to move to Belgium, do I have to register, and by which deadlines, uh, how, where do I have to go to concretely. So we work a lot also with national administrations. Uh, we provide the basic uh, information on EU rights, but then also link through to information provided by national administrations. That was done until now on an informal basis. It's interesting that we are structuring, that the commission and member states have made a legal commitment to provide this sort of national information as well. And also, interestingly, to translate it at least into English. So member states will be translating this type of information into English. Well, some countries already have that, uh, others don't. Uh, and uh, maybe not for all topics that are covered by, uh, by our scope. Um, we also, yeah, we, we help users really identify their uh, situation and uh, um, through the maze of EU uh, rules, well, passenger rights, for instance, there are, uh, there's legislation, then there is case law that is constantly updated. It really depends on your situation. We really uh, try to uh, explain, take users to the situation they are in and explain the, the rules as, as, uh, as they are in their concrete case. Um, so um, now for us, now it's been, uh, I think, uh, an interesting approach uh, and a successful approach. We are at the moment one of the three most visited websites managed by the European Commission. Uh, we have roughly this year 3 million visits per month. Uh, now our target audience is much bigger than yours. Uh, so we, uh, you almost reach all, the, all the, 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 the residents in Milan. We, we don't reach all the citizens in Europe, but we are growing uh, quite uh, constantly. Um, what is most interesting, I think, that the uh, most important source of visits to the website, as I was saying, is Google itself. We never really um, focused a lot on branding, and perhaps now it, we will have to, because it's now also a requirement under this new legal commitment we made, so we made a commitment also to strengthen a bit the brand. But uh, most of the visits come from Google because we focus a lot on the language and try to make it match what, what people search for on Google. So we do a lot of search engine optimization. We do it in the original English version. We were a bit afraid that all the effort we put into the English version gets lost when we translate. But after checking, actually, not only the overall number of visits to different language versions, but more in-depth uh, for a couple of language versions, we made a bit more uh, in-depth research. We saw that actually all, all languages we translate in are quite well in terms of indexation thanks to the work of colleagues in DGT in the translation uh, department of the commission. So um, you'll see that uh, English, yes, it is by far the most visited part of the website, or the most visited version, but it is uh, not. It's only a quarter, less than a quarter of visits that go to the English version. All other languages are very well represented. Uh, even uh, Estonian, for instance, I checked. In the first three quarters of the year, we had 80,000 visits from Estonia in, to the Estonian version, sorry, of the website. Now, that's uh, uh, for a population uh, of uh, uh, one million Estonians, that's quite an achievement if we had the same rate for other languages, uh, we would have even higher uh, number of visits, probably. But that only shows that, yes, translating is important for the citizens themselves, for the business owners, so that they can find the information where they search for it. And let's face it, they search for it via Google. Um, in the language, they search for it. And it's very important for us also as an institution. It has an added value for us as an institution as, and for the member states because there are also lots of misconceptions and it is in our institution's interest to explain and to ensure that people know their rights and their obligations and they understand them in their own language. Mm -hmm. So I 
Managed? Yes. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Now, we knew when planning this session that there would be a, a, a time squeeze. Uh, and I see that we have 18 questions on Slido. Uh, and I don't think we're going to be able to get through all of those. Never mind. Um, maybe a couple, I think. Um, but also, I'd, I want to take a couple of questions from the room as well. Um, so if anyone has a burning question for either of our panelists, just put up your hand. OK, someone over here and there's someone over here. All right, that's it. I'll take you two, and then. Uh, but first, I want to do two slider questions, okay? Really quickly, because they uh, can we show them up on the screen, please? Um, because they were two specific people, um, and the top voted question was: Does Milan reread the ma machine translations? Yes. <laughs> just, just keep talking. Have faith. Yes, uh, and that <laughs> yes, and that's the reason why we. We want to change uh, uh, a little bit the, uh, the result of that, uh, of course, are not uh, good or in some part can provoke some, some love, okay? But uh, remember that the, uh, what we want to uh, provide is an additional tool to a person that uh, needs to um, uh, make a new ID card and don't have a clue where the office are at what time they, they are open, they close, what are the documents. And at least in this part, uh, they, uh, instead of not translating it all, there was also a slide, uh, a slide on that, not translating it all or providing a support, is we judged that was already something. We uh, believe that is important and we want to do more, probably putting a process. So I read, uh, rereading it means probably the process I was uh, um, explaining you on the very last slide were saying that uh, still use the uh, automatic translation tool, but then uh, having the opportunity of uh, modifying that. Uh, so, but there you need someone with the, uh, let me say, the language skill of that language. Uh, so, and, and it's not easy for uh, the budget and the resource of a, a small town like Milan. And can you pass the microphone to Lucio? Because he's the next one that I want to... Uh, there were a number of questions for Lucio. Um, but I, there was one... That, well, th there's two that you can see there. The one that I thought was incredibly interesting was the one about alleged human rights violators ever use poor translations in their defence. Well, can you hear me? Um, well, not that... I'm aware of, uh, Goodness. <laughs> uh, then you never know, you know, you can be surprised many times, uh, but not, not that I'm aware of, no. And would you like to a a ask yeah. the top one, which is, yeah. a, so, I think there's people in yeah. the room trying to get a job here, and this is... Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I mean, um, when it comes to the International Secretariat of Amnesty International, I mean, we are part of the International Secretariat, we work with professional paid translators. But uh, Amnesty, as you know, is quite big, and there are sections, which are the national representations, like Amnesty Italy or Amnesty France, etc. And uh, I know that some of them, uh, because of financial means, or lack of financial means, they do work with volunteer or pro bono translators, which I think we have to differentiate between the volunteer and pro bono. Uh, pro bono being a professional translator, you know, providing services uh, for free and volunteer someone who is not trained in translation. Yeah. Um, so not, it's not, not our case in the Language Resource Centre, but okay. I know of some sections, yes. Okay, thank you. Now I'll take the questions from the room. I will go for the, the woman who I pointed to over here who wanted to ask a question. Have you... Yes, hello. Um, my name is Marta. I come from Poland. And um, I have a question to the last speaker about uh, the Your Europe platform. I actually stumbled upon the platform just a few days ago. And what I noticed is that where, whereas the website is um, available in different languages, um, there is no social media platforms in other languages than English, I think. Well, I didn't um, find the Polish version. So my question was whether it is planned to implement also social media um, for your Europe, and if so, how would you um, how would you have them 
with parallel content or would that not be necessary maybe? I can reply. So uh, is it working? Yes. Um, we do have social media channels for your Europe. We do post from time to time in Polish, but it's true that we post, uh, I, I would say, mostly in English. Uh, we do translate into different languages. Uh, they are usually the languages that we can also manage in our small team without resorting to uh, translators, unfortunately. Uh, also DGTs, uh, uh, um, well, they, they translate for our website, but they do not translate for social media. Uh, so uh, we have to make do a bit with, with the, the resources we have in our team. Um, and that uh, basically answers uh, also another question that was that I saw on Slido there. Uh, yes, we do promote the website, but we never promoted its brand. We promoted accessibility, access to the website. We made sure via search engine optimization and a little bit of online advertising that people find the website when they need it. That has always been our policy. Now, there is a requirement that we developed a bit more our brand. It may make sense with very specific target audiences, I think. Uh, not where I hope that nobody uh, um, uh, has uh, uh, a need to consult information on air passenger rights every, every second day, because that would mean that l flights are always late. Uh, <laughs> but for specific audiences, it may mix, it does make sense to develop the brand a bit more. So, and we will do that through social media, and we will need to use more languages. The other question that I saw is whether we use in-house trans in -house translators. I think that I also yeah. mentioned it. Yes, we use DGT. Okay, thank you. And uh, the woman over there, thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank Amnesty International. They gave me work when I started as a freelance translator. Uh, they were unfailingly kind and helpful. The subject matter was not nice. Some of it had to do with uh, the plight of our colleagues around the world. But one of the things they did, they gave good support they gave dignity to our words as translators, and they were great at payment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I was going to continue, but actually, I think I would like to finish on that because I think that's a very great, you know, good at payment is a is a very good uh, <laughs> good way of finishing this session, um, among other things. Oh no, they say we can have four minutes left. All right. Well, in that case, we'll carry on. Does anyone else have any uh, burning questions? We've got time for some more. Anyone at the back of the room? Everyone is very quiet at the back of the room. I'll see your hand. Let's just see if I see anybody else. Oh, oh well, there's a gentleman over right in the corner over there. Uh, Claudio Fantinoli from the University of Mainz. I have a question for Luca Curioni. Um, I'm very much interested in machine translation, machine interpreting from the user perspective. Uh, have you had some feedbacks on the usability, on the advantages of uh, your project to using machine translation to give access from the users. Yes, and uh, uh, that's uh, varied a lot. We, we did some, uh, not quantitative, but qualitative uh, uh, focus group on that. And uh, um, vary a lot from the uh, nationality. For example, uh, German speaker where, what are you doing? Take it out immediately. <laughs> you are destroying my language. Okay, so that's. Uh, um, but on the other part, the the people uh, that uh, that um, are uh, let me say in, in German speaker uh, living in Milan and access to that services, they talk uh, fluently Italian, and uh, th was not probably that the target we were trying to capture. The target, as I was saying, was Philippines, uh, Arabic. Uh, uh, Spanish uh, from Latin America and from this group of people it was perceived well at least as a one step uh, in their direction for and to be included uh, in the uh, in the city life thank you um, uh, I'm going to there's just a question that has just caught my eye on the on the slido um, which I'd also like to ask you, Pascal, um, from uh, the point of view of uh, EMPSIT. 
about um, translations or adaptations for people with disabilities, which is obviously a, a fundamental thing as well. And do you, do, is that the type of, do you do any work in that, in that area? Or is it something that you're pushing for? Well, to tell you the truth, we don't. Uh, but we are in, in contact with uh, EFSLI, which is an organization that uh, does sign interpreting uh, for deaf, deaf uh, so they're already there, and we try to collaborate with them. Okay, and um, uh, what about uh, your Europe? Uh, well, for persons with disabilities, you mean whether we... Um, is that the... Yes. Yes, well, the website is accessible. We, uh, it's one of the uh, most important aspects for us, uh, that it stays as light as possible for everybody and it is as accessible as possible. Usability is one of, of our main concerns. Usability done well grants also, also access to, to all sorts of different audiences with different levels of ability. And also in terms of the quality of the texts, that's very important for us. In English and in the translations, it has to be as user-friendly, as understandable as possible. That's good for the general public, but particularly good for people with uh, intellectual disabilities, for instance. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I am going to stop it now. Thank you very much for your patience in staying a little bit longer, but I think it was worthwhile. It was a very interesting debate. Um, we are now about to start the parallel sessions virtually immediately. Um, uh, so in here, we've got Shopping Without Borders, Language and Retail.